Thank you for listening to this Podcast One production. Now available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, PodcastOne.com, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. There is a place that is spoken about only in whispers. A dark area that spawns the beginnings of urban legends. A place where anything can happen and usually does. During the light of day, it hides just outside of you. But when the sun goes down, spirits, creatures of the night, roam free. And things do go bump in the night. It is in every state and every country. And there is no escaping it. No matter how safe you feel behind your locked doors and latched windows. So we invite you to turn down the lights and turn up your radio while we join Dave Schrader and Tim Dennis, your hosts, on a journey into the darkness on the edge of town. Hello and welcome. You're tuned in to the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Darkness Radio. I'm your host, Dave Schrader. That guy over there is Tim Dennis sitting at the Supernatural News Desk. And Tim, we have to start today's show with a bit of a heavy heart. Although not necessarily an unexpected turn of events, but it is still sad nonetheless. Obviously, we've spoken now for many years regarding our version of the Mandela effect, Mm -hmm. which we referred to as who brought Kirk Douglas back from the dead. Mm -hmm. Yep. For those of you that are new tuners and have just found us, we talked about this probably eight or nine years ago. We discussed these strange memories and I had a very clear memory in the late eighties. I believe it was shortly after Kirk Douglas suffered his debilitating stroke It was not long after that he passed away. And I remember the little press conference on Entertainment Tonight. I I, down to what Michael Douglas was wearing as he talked about his father. I remember it specifically. And all of a sudden, people started pouring in with messages. They remembered the same scenario. This was before the term Mandela effect had even been coined. That's why we called that episode, Who Brought Kirk Douglas Back from the Dead? Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, yet, Kirk Douglas just turned 103 years old. So it was something that has baffled many of us. How do we have such a a perfect memory of his passing 35 years ago, but yet he's still very much alive? Well, um, unfortunately, a few days ago, uh, Mr. Douglas finally succumbed and, and passed away at 103 years old and uh you know this year in our 2020 predictions i predicted this would be the year for kirk douglas's passing and unfortunately i was correct um but i want you to know that in all the years of us joking around and talking about kirk douglas's first death which apparently never happened we never meant any disrespect to Mr. Douglas, his career, or his family. It was simply something that we reported on this this false memory or Mandela effect memory that had taken place for many of us. And you have all turned out, man. I, geez, Tim, I think I've been tagged in about a thousand posts, <laughs> and people have sent me links on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and personal emails and direct messages and. You know, the Kirk Douglas uh, really passed. And the funny question is they all reach out to me and they're like, is this true? Like I've become the definitive answer on the death and life of Kirk Douglas or the life and death and death of Kirk Douglas. Um, Yes, it is true. He has passed away. Uh, You know, let's see what the big batch of sketch of life shows us. And, you know, five years from now, is he back at, you know, celebrating birthday 108 if so then we've probably crossed some threshold into another reality or at least some of us have and uh, that's been my thought um and i still stand by that tim that that kind of escalator version of how life works Mm -hmm. uh that it's like a step ladder you know that we're we're you know the bible tells us we're guaranteed this super long life but yet people die all the time And the one thing that I have noticed in talking to people over these last eight, nine years regarding the Mandela effect is many of them had close scrapes with death or near death experiences. And I've, I've wondered 
if in those instances when you should have died, when you collapsed in our in our dining room in college, Tim, and suffered that massive seizure, in that reality, did we lose you and your consciousness just took a step to the right and, and became part of this world? So in that parallel universe, we lost him, Dennis. And that's why you have memories that don't necessarily match up. The time that I went through the, you know, smashed my head through a windshield and, and should have been killed. Did that jump me to another timeline? Because in that reality, my life did end, but it continues on here. My consciousness blends over into the next so that with every death, we become a more well-rounded person. We become our consciousness becomes more cohesive and and we keep making these these virtual steps but with it we take these small echoes of the past the life that we knew in that other reality well if if i may uh fire up the spliff and pass it to the left for a second Mm -hmm, um mm -hmm. while i was you may think this is kind of weird but you know a a few uh, actually it was now over two years ago when i was in the hospital with sepsis and i came within 60 seconds of actually checking out um it's hit me the last couple of years that I've had moments when I've sat here and thought, I don't know that I should really be here right now. I feel like I've, I'm, I'm living or I have been living on borrowed time. And mm. I had one of those moments, actually, when I was in Florida. I stayed behind for a week to visit family in Tampa. And I was, I was out on the deck, and it was, it was after we had recorded t- True Crime Tuesday. And I was out on the deck, and I was just kind of looking out um, – uh, out on the canal, out in back of the house where I was staying. And I was watching this crane swoop down and it was picking up fish. And I had one of these moments. And the only way you can describe it is a moment where you feel like you don't belong. And it's a moment where you you sit there and you go, I really shouldn't be here right now. Mm -hmm. Not like, not like I shouldn't be here. Like I should be back home in Minnesota taking care of business or, I, you know, I shouldn't be here right now like, you know, like I have better things to do or anything like that. It was one of those moments like I really shouldn't be here right now. Like like you just have you ever had one of those moments like like yeah. you're sitting there going, I really shouldn't be here right now. Mm-hmm. I, I just like like you almost feel like the sands of time already emptied out of your hourglass. And you really are living on borrowed time. Like you, like you probably should have already checked out, but you, you're, you really are living on borrowed time. And I, I, I've, I've had that moment. I don't know. I'd, I'd say probably six or seven times since that, that moment a couple of years ago. It's weird to explain, but, but it's, it's, it's just a gut feeling. You get that gut feeling and it's not a sad feeling by any means. It's just like a, and and it's not a fortunate feeling. It's just a feeling where you go, wow, this feels weird. It feels like you're almost like you said, like out of time. Yeah. I don't, I don't know what to make of it. I mean, is it the, and and to answer your question, yes, I have had times where I, I feel like I don't belong to this world. Which is really weird, and I know that says something when you're the host of this show, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> you know that uh, that when something feels weird, how do you uh, how do you wrap your head around it? Um, yeah, I don't know. It's a it's it's a weird scenario. The whole um, kind of concept of of parallel universes and lives continuing on, but just you know, the consciousness joins another part of that realm. So you may be kind of feeling that almost like a mourning for the life that you had. I don't know that it's mourning. I know this much. I've lost a lot of fear. I I don't fear as much as I used to. Right. Well, mourning is, I'm just trying to use that as an overall, you know, statement as though, I mean, you, you, you're not feeling like you're, you feel like your time has already ended, meaning you're kind of still, in you know still have a little bit of that residue from that past life onto this one i don't know i i don't know what the answer is it's bizarre i don't know it, it you know it's it um you know what it feels like almost i'll, I'll give you exactly what it feels like mm-hmm. it feels like um wherever this life was supposed to go it's like that path cut and it's done 
And uh, whatever it was that happened in that moment stopped wherever I was supposed to go. And the slate has been wiped clean. Mm -hmm. And wherever I go from now, from here on out now, is a combination of me driving my destiny, destiny, and it's a combination of that. I sound like I'm drunk. Me did destiny, and and a combination of that where the universe will take me and divine intervention. So you have those three, those three, that combo platter, if you will, that that will take over and drive me from here on out. But whatever might have been predetermined at the, at the time of my birth no longer exists because of factors that happen that change my path. Mm. I don't know why that pops up in my head, but it does. It, it's just because of that moment where maybe that's where I was supposed to cash out and I didn't. Um, it's changed everything completely. Could be. I don't know. Somebody's driving the ship now. Why not? it be you, right? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right, let's uh, let's talk about some other things. Let's get started. It's a supernatural news and parish share day. Tim, where shall we begin in the world of supernatural news? First of all, I see what you're trying to do here. I, I, I I'm looking at the stories here. I see what you're trying to do here. I'm going to hold off on this first story for a little bit. I, I, I see you're trying Chicken. to you're trying to wind me up. Here. You're trying to wind me up, but but I, I, I'm going to start. I'm going to start slow, Dave. I'm going to start slow and, and ease my way into it. It's it's a it's a new year, Dave. A new year, a new decade. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna ease my way into that story, <clears throat> if you don't mind. We'll talk about British X Files first. How's that? Whatever you feel is best. Sure, I mean, you're sure. the supernatural sure. news guy. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I you know, I, I've, I, I had, I, I, a few people were concerned. I got for in your my, head. I can already hear it. <laughs> a few people were concerned about my mental health a couple of weeks ago. Um, the fact that I was deluged by artificial intelligence stories, it's, it's, it's not, it, it didn't affect me in the slightest. I, I, let's just say it was a little overwhelming, but I'm good. I'm good. We'll start with British X-Files, Dave's, uh, UFO sightings going public. Uh, the UK's ministry of defense will publish secret UFO reports for the first time, evidently. Uh, from the early 1950s until 2009, a department in the UK's uh, Ministry of Defense documented and investigated reports of UFOs. Now, more than a decade after the program ended, many of those formerly classified files about UFO sightings will be made available to the public for the first time. Previously, some MOD files about UFOs had been published online at the UK National Archives website. Uh, however, all of the agency's UFO reports will be released this year on a dedicated government or gov.uk website, uh, a spokesperson for the British Royal Air Force told The Telegraph. Uh, the decision came after PA Media, a British news agency, filed a request for the UFO files under the Freedom of Information Act, according to The Telegraph. MOD officials decided it would be better to publish these records rather than continue sending documents to the National Archives, this according to an RAF spokesperson. The UK's fascination with UFOs spiked around 1950, prompting the MOD to form the Flying Saucer Working Party to address the phenomenon. You can feel free to jump in there if you no, want. No, I'm, no, I'm working on restraint. Okay, that's, do, that's do, good. Do. Mm -hmm. oh, working oh. on restraint. Do, 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 do. I'm working on restraint, Tim. Oh, oh okay. Do, 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 Yeah. Yet you still did it. Stop it. Mm -hmm. uh, UFOs in the early 1950s even captured the attention of Prime Minister Winston Churchill, who makes a hell of a cigar. I don't know if you've ever tried it before, Dave, uh, who sent a memo to his era minister in 1952 asking, uh, what does all this stuff about flying saucers amount to? What can it mean? What is the truth? The flying saucer group concluded that UFOs were hoaxes, delusions, or ordinary objects that were misidentified, recommending that no further investigation of reported mysterious aerial phenomena. Mm -hmm. Is this payback for AI? Is that what it is? No. Phenomena. <clears throat> mm hmm be undertaken. Uh, nevertheless, other MOD divisions continued the work of official UFO investigation in the UK, ushering such efforts into the 21st century. 
the last UFO report to be published online by the MOD dates to 2009, covering sightings that took place from January through the end of November of that year. These included a silver disc-shaped light reported in January of 2009, up to 20 orange and red glowing lights reported in June, a large bright silver white ball or sphere reported in July, and three blazing gold orbs and a diagonal line in the sky reported in September. After MOD enacted a policy change on December 1st of 2009, the agency no longer recorded or investigated UFO sightings, according to the report. But what they did find, including many recent UFO reports that were previously available only as hard copies, will be published online within the next few months. That, according to Nick Pope, a former UFO investigator for the MOD. All right. Yeah. Well, that's that's kind of exciting. I wonder what new information we're really going to get. Uh, that uh, aliens party with the queen and have tea every day at 4.30. Oh! Yeah, that's that's well, the main information. That is, that's yeah. special. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I thought yeah. so. <laughs> All right, well, uh, that's, that's the beginnings of this. What else have we got to uh, investigate in the world of supernatural news this week? Well, Dave, uh, I'm surprised we didn't see this when we were aboard the, uh, the ship of Jericho. Um, I looked over the starboard side many a time and, and didn't see this thing floating out there. But uh, a ship that mysteriously vanished in the Bermuda Triangle almost a century ago was discovered, and it wasn't by us. Hmm. Yeah. I, I'd have thought I'd have saw the thing. We did see something floating out in the in the uh, ocean. Yeah, that was a little uh, that that was a little heart racy, wasn't it? It was, yeah, yeah. But so, it, it was like a rafty thing. Yeah, yeah. I was. Uh, it, somebody told me what it looked like was a, a part of a dock had broken away and floated off. But when we first saw it, you're on this cruise ship, and all of a sudden you see this raft. I'm just thinking somebody's trying to make their way to America, and it didn't go so well. Well, I, I thought I saw the remains of Otis Redding. Um, no. Was he sitting on the dock of that bay? He was, yeah. yeah. Watching the tide roll him away? Yeah, it's a dated right. reference, but a good one. Mm, yeah. 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 Uh, the wreckage of a ship that mysteriously went missing in the Bermuda Triangle almost 100 years ago has been discovered off the coast of Florida, That's according to a team of researchers. The SS Cotopaxi, uh, an American merchant steamer, left Charleston, South Carolina on November 29th, 1925, loaded with coal. Uh, But the vessel vanished without a trace before arriving at its final destination, Havana, Cuba. The fate of the Cotopaxi uh, and the 32 people on board has long puzzled experts, and the ship's disappearance has become one of the most famous stories associated with the legend of the Triangle, a notorious region of the western North Atlantic Ocean where several ships and aircraft have said to gone missing in uh, strange circumstances. The Cotopaxi was on a routine voyage, marine biologist and underwater explorer Michael Barnett told Newsweek. Uh, She was employed in the coal trade, and so this was just another trip at the end of November in 1925. We know that on that voyage something happened because she delivered a May Day message in early December saying she's in distress. And then that was it. They never found any wreckage. They never found any lifeboats, bodies, or anything. The vessel just disappeared after that point. So we've been trying to determine what exactly happened. The story of the disappearance of the Cotopaxi uh, had, or has had a colorful past. Film director Steven Spielberg included the vessel in his sci-fi classic uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, in which it was discovered in the Gobi Desert, having apparently been placed there by extraterrestrials. In 2015, a news report said the ship had reappeared near a restricted military zone off the coast of Cuba. Various versions of this story emerged in the years that followed. All of them had been dismissed as hoaxes, however. Now, almost after a century of uncertainty and speculation, a more realistic explanation has emerged. Barnett and colleagues say they have located the wreck around 35 miles off the coast of St. Augustine on Florida's northeast coast. The discovery is revealed in an episode of Shipwreck Secrets, a new Science Channel series that starts next month. I've always been fascinated by history, Barnett, who has discovered the wrecks of numerous lost ships over the course of his career, went on to say, I'm a marine biologist by profession, but maritime history is my real passion. I like going out and trying to identify wrecks because everyone has a fascinating story. I'm just a very curious guy, he went on to say. 
The search for the wreck began thousands of miles away from the Bermuda Triangle in London, England. Barnett contacted British historian Guy Walters and asked him to dig through the archives of Lloyd's of London, which contains insurance documents related to the ship's fateful voyage. During his search, Walters managed to uncover evidence that the Cotopaxi uh, had sent out a distress signal on December 1st of 1925, a key piece of information that historians had not previously known about. A lot of times it's more important to spend more time in the archives researching than it is on the water because that's when you will make the discoveries in all these articles for insurance or things of that nature, he went on to tell Newsweek. According to the documents that he uncovered, the distress signals were picked up in Jacksonville, Florida, placing the ship in the vicinity of the so-called Bear Wreck, located off the coast of St. Augustine, which has baffled experts for decades. The waters off the coast of St. Augustine, a thriving port in colonial times, are filled with 16th and 17th century shipwrecks. The Bear Wreck, however, stands out from these in a number of ways. Firstly, it appears to be from the late 19th or early 20th century, and is located much further off the coast than most of the other older shipwrecks. The ship's real name and the reason it sank have long remained a mystery. With the evidence uncovered by Walters, Barnett and his dive partner, Joe Satelli, uh, decided to conduct a series of dives at the Bear Wreck in order to look for an artifact that could link it to the Cotopaxi. Specifically, they wanted to find an object with the vessel's name on it, something commonly found in the bell of ships. However, such discoveries are rare, and despite the use of a remotely operated underwater vehicle, the divers did not find what they were looking for, in part because the wreck is covered in large quantities of sand. Uh, Barnett did get in touch with uh, A.J. Perkins, a diver who has been exploring the bear wreck for more than three decades, collecting numerous objects from it in the process. One of those items in his collection seemed to provide a clue to the wreck's origins, uh, from there, they collected more evidence and eventually uh, got to the uh, bottom of the case. Uh, their research and findings can be seen in the premiere episode, Dave, of the new Science Channel series, Shipwreck Secrets. It premieres February 9th at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Subsequent episodes will premiere on Sunday nights at 9 p.m. So there you go. Very cool. Yeah, the Bermuda Triangle, uh, you know, floating through it now. For two years, three, actually, I did three cruises now through that. Uh, I haven't felt any danger until this last time. Yeah, I it was. Tape some of the waves. It was a, a rough cruise, yeah. Yeah, when you're on a big ship and uh, you can actually feel the rock, it wasn't bad, folks. I mean, it's a, you know, they, they would do their best to circumvent and go around the storms, which they did repeatedly. But, mm -hmm. you know, you could just see going through there how, boy, would your mind go into a spin as you're going through the Bermuda Triangle in a bad storm is giving the boat a good rock. And I actually liked it when it was rocking at night because yeah. I slept like a baby. Yeah. But yeah. uh yeah, that that's uh that was creepy and unusual. Speaking of creepy and unusual, Tim, I'd like to hear some stories from our listener. Sure. How do you do that? Well our listener, just the one just Tim, the one. Yeah. From our listeners, you can call our voices from beyond voicemail, six five one three zero zero four nine seven seven six five one three zero zero four nine seven seven and leave us one of your stories of the strange and unusual just like this caller did hi dave and tim this is lucy from alabama i've actually been to minnesota uh, my uncle uh, who lived in uh, bloomington died a couple of years ago and i uh, went up for his funeral and man the snow up there is really heavy it was really cold <laughs> Anyway, I don't know how you guys can handle it up there. This Alabama girl was really cold up there. But I wanted to give you my paranormal stories. I've um, got a couple of them. Um, I've had animals my whole life, and um, this has been uh, some years, but I had a cat named Domino. Uh, had him for 15 years, but he was about 17 when I lost him. He had been in kidney failure for a while, and I... Uh, the vet thinks that he might have had a heart attack. He died at the vet clinic. After I lost him, um, I was really upset. And um, I had a roommate who was actually not working the next day. And uh, I had cried so much the day before that I actually couldn't even go into work. My eyes were almost swollen shut. I was so upset. 
And uh, she drove me to the nearest Humane Society. We went there, and I uh, found two uh, Siamese kitten mixes, uh, and uh, they were brothers. I named them Joshua and Caleb. I just fell in love with them and adopted them and uh, brought them home. And um, they were just little wild children and uh, ran all over the place, jumping on the bed all the time. And I would find myself waking up in the mornings and feeling a cat jump on the bed. And I thought it was one of them. I would sit up, and I was awake when this would happen. I would sit up, and there was no cat on my bed. I just knew it had to have been Domino. And um, I I still miss Domino, but um, having Joshua and Caleb really, really seemed to help make it better. At least I felt like I was helping another animal, rescuing another, getting one um, safe in a, in a home. Well, some years went by and I lost Joshua. Um, and he, um, I lost him in Thanksgiving of last year. I'm still, I'm still missing him. He was about 17 and a half years old. I'm still hoping that, that he will come and visit me, um, as his brother Caleb did. I lost Caleb when he was only seven. He had a urinary obstruction, and about three weeks later, he was on the food that the vet had put him on. Um, He, Caleb uh, had had a urinary obstruction, and he was on the cat food that he was supposed to be on to keep him from getting another one. Um, He was running in front of my roommate. I was actually not at work. I was still at work at the time, sorry. And um, she was feeding my cats. Um, He was running in front of her, and he collapsed. And she rushed him to my vet. And um, he wasn't, he was already gone by the time he got there. The vet was stymied. He did not know what had happened to him. He couldn't understand why he died. Um, I pretty much got hysterical. When I found out, my roommate called me, and I was actually driving on my way home by then. And um, I just, um, I was very upset uh, because I had, I only had him for seven years. He was still fairly young. Um, I, um, I just became really upset, asking God constantly to let me know he was okay because I. I'd never lost a cat at such a young age. Um, about three weeks after he died, I was in bed asleep, and I woke up to his meow. Caleb, like I said, was a Siamese mix, and he had a hoarse meow that made um, him sound like he was asking a question because the pitch of his meow would go up at the end of it. And I heard that meow. I sat up in bed. And over to my right was a glowing white about the size of a basketball. And as I looked at it, I could tell it was Caleb because his stripes were really pronounced. He was um, a lilac point Siamese mix, and he was um, very striped. And the light was glowing through each of those stripes. I'd never seen anything like this before. I reached out to touch him, and the light just fizzled away. I believe that God allowed him to visit me to let me know that he was okay. I still hope that um, Joshua will be able to visit me, too, either the same way that Caleb did or in a dream. I, I just wanted to tell you guys, Caleb's story because I believe that animals do uh, go to heaven and I believe that when I get to heaven one day then that I will see my animals all my animals I've lost before I have another paranormal story and this one is actually from my mother Um, we lost um, my oldest brother in 1983 he was hit by a drunk driver when he was on his way home from work He was only 29 years old. 
I was still living at home with my parents, and we learned about it at um, 2.30 in the morning. My brother David was his roommate. Um, Martin was on his way home from work and um, evidently killed by a drunk driver, and uh, the police woke my brother up. Uh, and told him um, they needed him to come to the police station. They handed him Martin's wallet and asked him to identify it. And that's when they told him that um, he had been killed. Uh, We were pretty much desolate after that. None of us could sleep. And my mother told me later um, what happened. She was standing in the kitchen looking outside. Um, There was a pasture across the road with cows in it. Uh, There were power lines across uh, outside that fence line that ran adjacent to the highway. And she was looking out across at the pasture, and as the sun was rising, um, the whole scene started to change. She said that um, the... All of a sudden, flowers started to appear, and the, it was just like lit up, like just totally different, a totally different scene than what she was really looking at before. And the the uh, the power lines that were there disappeared. They just faded away. And she felt a peace after that. She felt like that's where Martin was, that he was in heaven, and I think that God was telling her that he was in a place that was like this. It was beautiful, he was in no pain, and that he was happy. And uh, that was my mother's paranormal story. All right, here's an actual email, Tim. I don't know if you know this, but people can email me as well with their stories. Really? So you can call us on the Voices from Beyond voicemail at 651-300-4977, like that caller, or email them to me. Hi, Tim and Dave. Hi. I'm emailing you from the UK. This is about my daughter, who is now 31 years old. When she was about two or three years old, we hadn't been in this house very long, so the rooms needed decorating. Her room had this 70 styles wallpaper on the wall. She woke up in the middle of the night one night crying and pointing at her wall, saying, there is a man in the wall. There's a man in the wall. I put it down to her dreaming. Eventually, I managed to settle her down, and she went off to sleep. Six months went by, and it was time to redecorate her room. My husband and I were stripping off wallpaper in the room, and to our amazement, there was this hand-painted face of a man right where she had been pointing. I just looked at my husband and said, how on earth did she know? This was the start of many strange experiences that we have had as a family. Thank you for all your hard work. I love your show. Keep it up. And that comes from Pat. Pat, you're gonna, you're just gonna tease us. You're gonna give us the tip only. Mm-hmm. We need the whole story. Yeah. So if that's just the beginning, what else has happened? Write to me, Pat. We need more of your stories. If your daughter pointing at the wall, seeing a man there in the wall, and you pull off the wallpaper, and there is in fact a man painted on that wall, and that was just the start. I can't wait to hear the other bizarre things you have to share with us. So please shoot us an email. Fill us in with more of your stories. Tim, where are we going next in the world of supernatural news? We're going to Hollywood, Dave, where evidently stars are being possessed by the devil. The devil, you say? Oh, yeah. Yep. yep. Okay. Uh, Juliana Huff evidently uh, broke the internet this week with an exorcism-like video. I'd like to possess her myself. Well, too late, my friend. Evidently, the devil got her first. Okay, what? Yeah. I'll fight for her honor. You may have to. Take out my plus 12 uh, broadsword, Tim. Oh, broadsword. <laughs> mm-hmm. My plus 12 broadsword. Broadsword, yes. And I will uh, defend her honor mm-hmm. with the devil himself. I see. Yeah. Uh, people are saying the video is disturbing to watch. I don't know. If you watch it a certain way, it's not so disturbing. As I am. Uh, by now, we're all accustomed to the eccentric wellness trends of the Hollywood elite from Gwyneth Paltrow's Bee Sting Therapy, that's not the only disturbing thing if you've seen her goop catalog, uh, to Sandra Bullock's, I'm going to say this carefully, Dave, Sandra Bullock's penis facials. 
Uh, what? That's a thing, evidently. Uh, what? Yeah, Sandra Bullock's penis. I can't even say it. Sandra Bullock's penis facials. <clears throat> huh. Yeah, it's a thing. Okay. Yeah. And uh, Shalene Woodley's vaginal sunbathing routine. God, I need to move. Minnesota, yeah, you do. Minnesota's so boring. Oh. Uh, we become unfazed by the extreme measures that A-listers go to for their beauty and health fixes. And until this week, we thought we'd seen it all. However, a new video of Julianne Huff receiving an energy treatment in Davos, Switzerland, this week has proved us wrong. This is an energy treatment, Dave. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. An energy treatment. Yes. Uh-huh. Dr. Amaral uh, demonstrated his treatment on the Dancing with the Stars Pro, who could be seen contorting and yelping in a video captured by onlookers. Oh, boy. Uh, there's always a huge dissipation of energy and the feeling of relief, release, freedom, Amaral told the uh, crowd. Expression of emotion may happen when the system moves, if you know what I mean. He continued as Huff twitches in the background. You're going to want to see this for yourself, Dave. Oh, I'm watching it right now. Yeah. Uh, hey. Stunned, stunned adoration. Uh, hands on the table, Dave. Hands above. Pardon above, me? What? Hands above the waist. When you're they watching. are. I just okay. I have an itch on my right. thigh. Okay. Uh, when energy was stored and bound up in the muscles, it gets to dissipate. And if we're really free to express and allow energy that's been bound in our bodies to move through, this woman is like an incredible dancer, actress, just human being. And she has practiced just allowing things to move through, is uh, how Dr. Amaral puts it. Huff's writhing response to Amaral's treatment has sent shockwaves through social media, of course, uh, with some users even comparing her body's response to an exorcism. One commentator wrote, This is demonic. The demon is trapped in her little body. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke this woman. Bye. Take it, Jesus. <laughs> Hmm. that's that's very um that's that's almost kind of like you're up on stage you're playing a little you're playing a little solo and you're like take it jesus I, yeah I, I don't know uh i've never had to had to have jesus come in and play the last half of a solo for me but why not well, I, I got to be honest with you, Tim. I also uh, had to jump and take a look at, uh, and let me warn you, folks, be careful. I, I took the bullet for you. Typing in Sandra Bullock and penis. Facial? Facial. Yeah. Will give you um, pages you don't want to know about. Really? But yeah, here, hmm. here's uh, here's what it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, according to this article yeah. from the Huff Post, it says Hollywood stars love their eccentric facials, and it often seems like they'll put anything on their faces. Oh my. The latest buzzy ingredient, ingredient though, foreskins. <gasps> no. Yes, you read that right. Last week, Sandra Bullock appeared on the Ellen DeGeneres show. This is an article from a few years ago, and revealed that she and Kate Blanchett are fans of what they've dubbed the penis facial. Mm. See. The treatment involves the use of something called epidermal growth factors, or EGF for short, which are derived from stem cells taken from discarded foreskins of newborn babies mm. in Korea. EGF is said to help rejuvenate the skin, improve overall skin texture, and correct discoloration. It's also known for its ability to aid in wound healing. The treatment costs six hundred and fifty dollars. Whoa! Mm-hmm. Do you think- Following the micro needling, you uh, use a special electrifying mask to calm the skin. Then comes the penis aspect. Oh, right. What Louise calls her secret box of EGF serum. Oh, the no. EGF is derived from the uh, cells of a human fibroblast taken from Korean newborn baby foreskin which helps to generate collagen and elasticin. People are weird, dude. People are weird. But That's a thing. That's a real thing. I can save her a little bit of money. Mine's like a newborn baby. I could just slap it right on her cheek. <laughs> I'm just saying. You remember about keeping this uh, yeah, I, I, friendly? I'm just yeah. saying. I'm, I'm, uh, let's stick with that okay. model. We want right. to go that way okay. going forward. Yeah. Um, it's weird yeah. enough that the actual story is using Korean baby foreskins. It is. That's very but weird. 
ain't nobody on this planet need the visual you just put into their heads. <laughs> so let's just, uh, kids, just here, look at me as I put on my sunglasses and raise my my men in black wand, and I'm going to just help you pulse that thought out of your mind. Are you ready? And anyway, let's get back to the show, Tim. Okay. Um, the, there was one Instagram user that watched poor Julianne Huff try to expel energy saying, what did right. I just watch? Uh, right. This was disturbing to watch. It is weird. It's very, I'm watching it. And uh, it's not even erotic. There's nothing erotic. It just looks like she's spasming out of control as he's kind of waving his hands over her. Uh, another viewer wrote, I don't know yeah. whether this is absolutely hilarious or absolutely terrifying. My mind is still processing what I just witnessed. This can't be real. She is officially cult status. Uh, Huff herself commented on the original video shared with Jackie Schimmel Haas. Uh, saying, I thought the same thing when I first saw it, too. So there you go. Weird. Yeah, take a look at it, folks. Uh, it's, look at the different things people are willing to do to try to bring their body, soul, <laughs> and faces back to a form of rejuvenation. It's bizarre. Although I would be happy to witness there with holy water to sprinkle on Juliana Huff should she need it in case the, the devil gets... Uh, gets a hold of her tim i'm just i'm one of those kind of guys i don't like to brag i don't like to call myself a hero but for juliana huff i would do that well, that's nice yeah yeah well i'm a giver yeah i'm a giver all right where are we off to next a three thousand year old egyptian mummy speaks again with some high-tech help you might need that holy water <laughs> mm. just saying i don't know uh, using a model of a 3,000-year-old mummy's vocal tract, researchers have approximated the voice of a long-dead Egyptian priest. <sighs> where, is, uh, where is Brendan Fraser when you need him? <laughs> uh, they were able to create a single burst of sound, a vowel-like bleat between the E in bed and the ah in bad. So he sounded like a goat, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, yeah kind of like that. So that's the. So I, I got to know more. What they're they're they took a mummy. They're trying to make it. They're okay. I'm sorry. Just go ahead. I'll shut up and let you fill us in. All right. The study published Thursday in the journal Scientific Reports is a sort of science that at first seems to beg for the B movie treatment. The mummy croaks again, uh, but there is more serious motivation involved as well as more respect for the deceased person wrapped in burial cloth. Study authors said that the priest named Nasaya Mun uh, would be pleased with this post mortem recreation of his voice. It is a fulfillment of his belief to have his voice heard in the afterlife. And study author John Schofield, an archaeologist at the University of York in England, went on to say Nasaya Mun uh, worked as a scribe at the Temple of Karnak in Thebes. Um, Thebes, yeah. Thebes, Thebes. Mm hmm. Tomato, tomato. Uh, his voice would have been critical in his priestly duties as he spoke, chanted, and sang. Nasaya Moon was mummified and entombed in a coffin inscribed with hieroglyphs, mainly texts from the Book of the Dead. Since 1823, this body has been kept at Leeds City Museum, where his body was unwrapped. Scholars, surgeons, and chemists have examined him in the many years since, probing the mummy by microscope, endoscope, and x-ray. A multidisciplinary scientific investigation of Nasaya Moon, um, published in 1828, was the first of its kind in the world, Schofield said. In the new work, scientists have made precise measurements of Nasaya Moon's well-preserved vocal tract using a CT scanner at Leeds General Infirmary. From this scan, they printed a 3D copy of his throat and hooked it up to a loudspeaker. They fed an electronic signal, a simulation of a human larynx acoustic output, said study author David Howard, through the faux organ to produce the voice. The single sound represents a proof of concept work, said Howard, who studies human speech and singing at Royal Holloway, a part of the University of London. To produce other vowels would require changes to the shape of the vocal tract, Howard said. That is their next step with the eventual goal of producing words, singing, and even speech. Uh, vocal tracks are biologically unique, said David, or I'm sorry, rather Daniel uh, Bodney, uh, an aeroacoustics expert at the University of Illinois, who is not part of the research team. The study's authors captured Nasiamun's uh, from his lips back down to the trachea, 
but the vocal tract is only half of what makes the human being sound like the human being, Bodney said. Uh, the other half flutters at the base of the tract. The vocal f- folds, also known as chords or reeds, uh, human vocal folds vibrate at multiple frequencies, yielding richness and emotion, and the sound the vibration produces is further distorted by traveling through the tract. An electronic substitute for fleshy vibration is why this recreation sounds tinny, Bodney went on to say. Bart DeBoer, who uh, studies the evolution of speech at a, a university in Brussels, said that I do think the sound is an accurate recreation of a sound that Nisayamun would have or could have made. Uh, simple fixed utterances of ah-like sounds do not require the movement of tongues or teeth. But DeBoer said, uh, mm-hmm. we also do not really know whether this vowel noise was a sound that was actually used in his language. Uh, the study authors. Into- this is a weird study. It is a very weird we, study. We, we spent a lot of dumb money doing dumb things. I wonder what it would sound like if we forced sound through the vocal cords of a mummy. We'll be able to hear his voice for the first time in centuries. Who who cares? Who cares what a ah oh, we sounds like from a thousand year old mummy? Who cares? Well, in that way, you, you can know get it just a- from Larry King interviews currently. Well, th- that way you know if he's re- reanimated or not, Dave. Mm, yeah, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, the study authors anticipate that this recreation of future expansions of Nassimon's voice will be a hit with Leeds' audience of museum goers. Oh, so they're going to make a puppet out of him. See, th- we're getting to the point right now. Uh, when visitors- I got no strings to hold me down, <laughs> to make me laugh or make me frown. So they're turning him into <laughs> King Pinocchio Common. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when visitors encounter the past, it is a is usually a visual encounter. With this voice, we can change that. Schofield said, "There is nothing more personal than someone's voice." Oh, so the, yeah, they're making him a puppet. Uh, the uh, dimensions of Nasiman's tract, smaller than a modern adult man's, uh, suggest he might have been a tenor. Also, they're going to make him sing. See, uh, if so, the priest would have been a welcome addition to singers. Howard directs. <laughs> We need them in my choir, Howard said, meaning tenors, not mummies. So he's going to be a uh, a singing puppet. They're going to basically put him in a Disney uh, deal, like like when they recreate the presidents and the Hall of Presidents. Um, hmm. They're going to have the Hall of Singing Mummies. <laughs> see see how they do that? Yeah. All right. Yeah. So is it like they're going to have Hall. Are we going to put them together like a little barbershop quartet? Yeah. yeah, yeah. See the the four tenors, the four mummies, and you just uh, you get to hear, I don't know, what, what are they going to do? Are they, I hope they do like Iron Maiden songs Yes. or Judas yeah. Priest, but yeah. as operatic versions. Is right. that wrong? Yeah, breaking the law Yeah, in, in an in a operatic setting. Yeah. Um, and, and they could play, uh, you know, they could play like ancient instruments. Um, and, uh, they'll release an album. It'll be a hit. Um, you know, they'll win Grammys. It, it, it'll be like blue man group, but creepier. Yeah. 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 Bandage man group is more like it. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be great. It'll be awesome. Seriously. Do we need this kind of, I mean, if you think about it, do we really need to know? I don't think we do. I think we waste a lot of stupid money researching a lot of stupid things what are we going to gain from hearing what their voice may have sounded like oh it's cool though now you get to hear a a voice but it's not really even the voice it's just a forced sound i'm sure if you pumped some air in there and then pushed on his belly his butt will sing for you too i don't need to hear what (gasps) the the great pharaoh sounded like when he passed wind dave farting mummies the comedy album come on you just came up with a great idea farting mummies comedy album i don't know i don't know man ancient farts i that would be such a great museum piece i would go back to a museum farting mummies yeah we would see if they truly could fart dust you my friend are on the cutting edge of science i like to think so i'm glad that you're finally catching up to that yeah huh so is that uh that the basics of that story (laughs) well yeah (laughs) okay all right (laughs) Hey, Dave, just watched your episode on haunted hospitals. Oh, with the incredibly athletic and black version of Tim. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I'll have you know, I got an NBA contract off of that deal. <laughs> you 
you should have. Mm-hmm. I also experienced a haunting in a hospital, but luckily I had my digital recorder with me. I was able to record my contact with the spirits. Two of these EVPs recorded in 2009 when I was in a hospital for prostate cancer surgery. Sorry, I had to swallow between words. The third was recorded as I was getting tested in the hospital. These are not my only hospital clips that I have. What I would do is record in the late evening after visiting hours. I would ask my door be shut. Then I'd place the recorder on my chest and ask if anyone wanted to communicate with me. In the first clip I got, we just need his help. They say I'm dead. In the second clip he recorded, Hi, Neil, our friend, get her out of here. F with you. Only it said the full word, Tim, the full F, F and Heimer. Farnsworth? Yes. Hmm. Farnsworth with you. The third clip was recorded about five years ago. As I was being sedated for a test, I felt a lost spirit in the room with me. I asked why he was lingering in the hospital. The spirit answered in a surprised, in a hospital? As if he wasn't aware of his location. Huh. I've heard from others that the reason I get no response is that people think I fake my clips. I do not. I've, I've, uh, the clips I've posted to YouTube are a very small sampling of my collection in the last 15 years. I've been retired. I have recorded thousands of clips. I hope you get a chance to listen to some of my work. I think you might appreciate it. And that comes from Neil Kiernan, a.k.a. EVP Kiernan, Tim. Probably oh. his uh, YouTube page, EVP Kiernan. Clever. Can't be certain. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty interesting. You're, you're trying to get the voice of uh, mummies. Yeah. This guy's just getting dead people swearing at him in the hospital. I like it. Now, if you can yeah. get him to fart, that would be even better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know if that would be such a such a great addition to this. All right. Where are we off to next? Uh, there's an article out there on the uh, History Channel asking if uh, Hangar 18, the legendary alien warehouse, actually exists. Really? Yeah. What if they've got any extra storage for all of my comic book boxes and uh, superhero toys? Because it's taken up a whole damn attic, Tim. Well, here's the deal. Aliens uh-huh. might actually break open the boxes with your toys in them. That's fine. If it's aliens, you know, they need something to play with. They're bored, Tim. They're off planet. They're looking for something exciting. They can play with my rare German uh, Spider-Man. Der Spider-Man toys that I have. Dave, the value goes down if they break open the box. Really? Does it go down when aliens have played with your toys, Tim? I think that might actually increase the value. No. Mm-hmm. No. Mm-hmm. No. All right. Well, it's worth Al- a try. So, aliens, uh, Hangar 18, what now? Aliens are dirty, Dave. Uh, as home to Project Blue Book, Ground Zero for Government Investigation of UFOs from 1951 to 69, Wright Field, now Wright-Patterson Air Force Base outside Dayton, Ohio, ranks up there alongside Area 51 as a subject of enduring speculation. I said speculation. Uh, many of the rumors surrounding Wright-Pat, as it's known for short, involve what might have gone on inside a particular building known as Hangar 18, UFO enthusiasts believe the government hid physical evidence from their investigations, including flying saucer debris, extraterrestrial remains, and even captured aliens in this mysterious warehouse, uh, specifically inside a sealed, highly guarded location dubbed the Blue Room. The legend of Hangar 18 goes back to the supposed crash of a UFO in in the desert near Roswell, New Mexico in July of 1947, according to a press release issued by the Roswell Army airfield at the time their personnel inspected the flying disc and sent it on to higher headquarters a subsequent press release from an air force base in fort worth texas assumed to be the aforementioned headquarters claimed the disc was a weather balloon a claim that the air force acknowledged was untrue in 1994 admitting that it had been testing a surveillance device designed to fly over nuclear research sites in the soviet union But in addition to Fort Worth, many UFO researchers believe some of the material from Roswell were also transported to Wright Field after the crash and stored in Hangar 18 based on unsubstantiated reports from former military pilots. One, Oliver Henderson, reportedly told his wife that he flew a plane loaded with debris along with several small alien bodies from Roswell to Wright Field. 
according to the children of another pilot, World War II ace Marion Black Mac Magruder. Uh, their father claimed to have seen a living alien at Wright Field in 1947 and told them it was a shameful thing that the military destroyed this creature by conducting tests on it. Senator Barry Goldwater of Arizona, the Republican nominee for president in 1964, was notoriously fascinated by UFOs and Hangar 18. Goldwater said publicly that he tried to gain access to the Blue Room in the early 60s, but had been denied access by a furious General Curtis LeMay. Even after Project Blue Book wrapped up in 1969, rumors continued to swirl around Wright Pat. In 1974, a Florida ufologist named Robert Spencer Carr publicly claimed that the Air Force was hiding two flying saucers of unknown origin inside Wright-Patterson's Hangar 18. According to a report in the Tampa Tribune, Carr claimed to have a high-ranking military source who saw the bodies of 12 alien beings while autopsies were being performed on them. Though Carr's claims were dubious, Widespread media coverage of them, as well as the release of the 1980 movie Hangar 18, helped cement the legend of Wright Pat as a hotbed of the government's UFO-related activities. For its part, the Air Force has categorically denied the rumors and maintains there has never actually been a Hangar 18 anywhere on Wright Pat, though there is a Building 18. Periodically, it is erroneously stated that the remains of extraterrestrial visitors are or have been stored at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. The Air Force said in an official statement issued in January of 1985, there are not now nor have there ever been any extraterrestrial visitors or equipment on Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And that is the conclusion of that statement from the Air Mm. Force. Yeah. Hmm. I don't buy it. You don't buy it? I don't buy it. I think there definitely has been. I say we storm Hangar 18. No, I <laughs> I'm not going to start that deal. I, I'm just saying. Greetings, Darkness Dave and Twilight Tim. I've been listening to the show for about four years. Last week's show on Shadow People was the one I was waiting for. Well, we've we've done other shows on Shadow People over the last four years. Why this one? Why, Tim? Well, stop bothering me. Let me read the letter, Tim, and you'll find out. God. Oh, oh, okay. Sorry. I lived with a shadow person for about nine years from the ages of six to 15. I have stories that I will share another time. No. Bitch, I don't even want to read anymore. (laughs) The reason that I'm writing this is because I had a similar experience that the guest had with the crossing of the arms. Mine happened after a dream about climbing out of a pit with countless hands trying to pull me down. I'm not sure, but... I think it was hell, he says. I woke up flat on my back with my right arm across my chest with my left to my side. It felt like I was going to be buried. It was hard getting back to sleep. I've had times that I felt like I would die if I went to sleep after that. Thank you, Tim and Dave, for helping me feel like I'm not alone in all my experiences from precognitive dreams, sleep paralysis, and dream visitations. From a less worried fan, Dante. Interesting. Hmm. Dante thought he was being pulled to hell. You know, it's interesting because when Mike Mike, uh, Ricksecker was talking about it, the experience that he's talking about, that Dante is talking about, that Mike was talking about on the show, Mike was in. It's a lot of talking about, yes. It's a lot of talking about. Um, Mike was talking about the shadow person approaching him in his room and coming up to him and crossing his arms like an X, almost like an Egyptian burial uh, ritual. Almost mm-hmm. like he was being prepared for burial. Maybe they were going to try to figure out a way to talk through his vocal cords. Oh, that would have been scary. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now that you mention it. Just throwing it out there. Yeah. So that was, uh, so that was the story, huh? Yeah, it was, it was bizarre in that, you know, when we think of shadow people, we, we tend to line it up with ghosts, aliens in the, in the, in the context that Mike was talking about it, he was almost talking about it in, in a time travel time slip type bridging, you know, that, that it might've, you know, he might've been bridging the gap between two civilizations. Like, like they were acting like they were preparing a child for burial in ancient Egypt. And he was the the child in that time. It was kind of interesting. 
All right. Very cool. Yeah. Well, let's uh, take another call. Our Voices from Beyond voicemail has another person that wants to share their story with us. You can do it. Pick up the phone. Give us a call. 651-300-4977, just like this caller. Hi, Dave and Tim. I have a story that I wanted to share with you. Um, it's very near and dear to my heart. So when I was about 20, I lost my dad, and I was extremely close to him. So it was, as you can imagine... Um, very painful, especially so for me because I felt like I'd lost my person. Um, my mom and I, you know, obviously loved each other, but we were very similar in personality and often butted heads. So shortly after my dad passed, um, I graduated from college and got my first real job, and I moved out of state. And I would come home for major holidays and stuff to see my mom and my sister, And on one of those trips home, my mom and I got into a gigantic fight. And I booked a flight home early because I just couldn't stand to be around her anymore. She was just aggravating me so much. And we were just fighting, and it was just not not a good thing. Now, when I was younger, when my mom and I would fight my dad, you know, my mom would send me to my room, and my dad would always come in, and he would talk to me and explain, you know, that my mom and I were so similar, and we had to learn to get along, and it was okay, and he was just kind of my calming voice. So fast forward to this fight, I'm scheduled to leave the next morning, and I was really upset about the fight, and I didn't want to leave on bad terms, but I didn't know what else to do, and my mom just wasn't quite herself still from losing my dad, um, and it was just a bad situation all of all over the place. So I had gone down into our basement where my dad had all of his weightlifting stuff. He was a power lifter. And it was a very soothing spot in our house for me um, because I really just felt like I channeled him there. And I was talking to him down there, and I happened to look up into the rafters of our basement, and I found a box. And in this box was a snow baby. So my dad used to give my mom snow babies for every um, holiday, birthday, anniversary, whatever, and they each had a special meaning. There's these like little tchotchkes or figurines and they have a special meaning to each of them. So this snow baby, when I opened it, was a snowman and he was holding a sign and it just said, where did he go? And I immediately got emotional. I brought it up to my mom and nobody said a word. We just cried for over an hour and it was my dad telling us or reminding us that we just had to get along because he wasn't there to help us talk that through. So I just wanted to share that with you, that our loved ones are always with us. I truly believe that. And best of everything to both you and Tim. Bye. All right. It is a Supernatural News Paris Share Saturday. Tim, where are we going next in the world of of supernatural news. Well, Dave, over the years we've talked about the Skinwalker Ranch. It's been featured in books and movies, and now it's finally getting its own TV show. Really? Yeah. Okay, let's hear it. Uh, the History Channel is uh, taking the leap, and the air date for that uh, nonfiction paranormal TV show has finally been announced. The Secret of Skinwalker Ranch, History Channel's latest nonfiction paranormal TV show, Promises to provide access to America's most studied paranormal hotspot for the first time. Skinwalker Ranch is located in Utah's, uh, is it Unitaw Bin or Basin? Unita, U- Basin? Unita, I think Unita? it is or something. Okay. Like, yeah. Okay. Uh, and stories of strange lights in the sky and encounters with bizarre creatures have been told for decades. Some even claim that the ranch has been a hotbed for paranormal phenomena since the early 19th century. Uh, billionaire Robert Bigelow purchased the ranch in the 90s after learning its spooky reputation and even employed physicists to study its alleged mysteries until 2004. Bigelow's interest didn't stop there, though. A 2017 New York Times article revealed a secretive, now-defunct government UFO program run by the Pentagon. According to the article in 2007, a defense intelligence agency official visited the ranch and a short time later met with Senator Harry Reid of Nevada. According to the New York Times, Mr. Reid said that he met with DIA agency officials shortly after his meeting with Mr. Bigelow and learned that they wanted to start a research program on UFOs. That program, the Advanced Aerospace Weapons System Application Program, was given to Bigelow under government contract. His company received $22 million to study and generate reports on exotic science, UFOs, and other anomalous phenomena. 
Uh, the strange events on the ranch, as well as other locations bearing purported paranormal anomalies, were involved in the study, that according to the New York Times. Bigelow sold the ranch to an American real estate mogul and tech investor in 2016. Recently, Vice gained exclusive access to the ranch and for the first time shed new light on research and technology being used by the ranch team to study the alleged paranormal phenomena that occurred there. According to a press release, the secret of Skinwalker Ranch will feature never-before-seen footage of the ranch and what it contains as the program follows a team of scientists and experts who conduct research on the expansive 512-acre property. The press release continues utilizing the latest and cutting-edge technology from lasers and ground-penetrating radar to drone thermography, uh, rockets, and more. The team will apply hard science and make shocking discoveries while going further and risking more than anyone has done on the ranch before. The Secret of Skinwalker Ranch premieres on the History Channel on Tuesday, March 31st at 10 p.m. Eastern Time. That'll be interesting. Oh, yeah. That's something I'll definitely be watching for, and we'll try to get somebody on the show to discuss the program and, and go a little further. How about that? That sounds good. Dave, I sent in a story, but I'm not sure you ever got to it, so I wanted to send it back into you. My moniker is Stan from Edmonds. Okay, Stan from Edmonds. This happened many years ago after my brother-in-law passed away in Hawaii. I was visiting my sister during Christmas, and late at night I would hear the little drummer boy playing on something like a music box. So one night I went searching for the source. I found it was a toy teddy bear that my sister had brought uh, for her son about 20 years ago. The next day I put it in the kitchen table and told the family he wants to join the party. After that, he never played that song again. In the evening, I was sitting in the family room. I looked around, and there was a stack of LP records, which my brother-in-law had collected. The album facing me was a collection of Christmas songs featuring the Little Drummer Boy. That comes from Stan from Edmonds. Thank you, Stan from Edmonds. Come, they told me, pum. That's sung by the Cowardly Lion, Tim. Very rare album. It is that, that yeah. It is yeah yeah. All right, uh, where are we off to next? Well, Dave, I'm going to ask for your help here because I have never been able to pronounce correctly uh, Obi Wan Kenobi's first name, uh, Old Danny from oh. Doctor Sleep. Um, you know. Oh, Ewan. Yeah, that guy. Ewan, Ewan McGregor. Is right. it is it Ewan or is it Ian? It's Ewan. Okay. Hmm. Not me and it's Ewan. It's not me and it's Ewan. Yep, you and McGregor. Okay, good. Because uh, every time I try to say it, it sounds like Ian. <clears throat> but it's Ewan, not me. Ian. It is. It's it's Ewan. Okay. Yeah, right. not Ian. You and McGregor. You and. All right. Mm -hmm. Good. All mm -hmm. right. Good. All right. We got it worked out then. Good. Okay. Uh, you and McGregor uh, told uh, Seth. Who? You and. <clears throat> you and who? You and me and. Oh, you and McGregor. Why didn't you just say so? All right. What's going on with you and McGregor? <sighs> he told his ghost story recently to Seth Meyers. I don't know if you watch the uh, the old late night with Seth Meyers. Oh, know. you know what? No, I don't. I, I'm not a fan of Seth Meyers. Uh, I watch him every once in a while. Yes. Oh, sorry to hear that. Well, he has some good comedy guests. Huh? Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So I watch it for the comedy guests. I like, I like the SNL guys. So I watch the SNL guys. Okay. Okay. So I, I caught you and me and McGregor on, uh, and he was talking about his ghost experience, which is actually quite uh, quite creepy. He had himself a real life ghost story, and if you love a ghost, good ghost story, and you don't watch Seth Meyers, and you missed out on it like Dave did. Uh, the forty eight year old actor appeared on Wednesday's episode of Late Night with Seth Meyers and recalled the paranormal encounter that he had decades ago. It happened on his 20th birthday, the Moulin Rouge star. I don't really remember him from Moulin Rouge. When you think you and me and McGregor, you don't think Moulin Rouge, do you? No, I think of him as uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi. I think of him in Train Spotting, and now I think sure. of him as uh, the hilarious and twisted black mask in Birds of Prey, the emancipation of uh, the fantabulous emancipation of one Harley Quinn movie, which I really enjoyed. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But okay. uh, go All ahead. Right. Sure. 
Uh, He was attending a drama school in London and was staying in student housing while his classmates were away for Easter and Passover. At one point, he decided to watch Blue Velvet and then take a bath. Sounds like a personal preference. Just saying. Uh, He said, I was suddenly struck with this pain on my back, he recalled. I ripped off my robe and there was a big black burn mark on the back of my robe. McGregor thought perhaps he'd caught fire on something or that there'd been a spark when he removed the tape from the VCR. However, he didn't find anything. I looked at the robe again and now I see the whole back of my robe was singed dark brown and then this black burn mark on my shoulder blade, he said. So I freaked out. I got out of there, and I went to spend my birthday with my Uncle Dennis. Uh, when he came back, he discovered that one of his fellow students, a neighbor downstairs, had returned. So he told him what happened. His face went ashen, McGregor recalled. McGregor was then told about a man who used to occupy the neighbor's apartment. Apparently, the man was an old reclusive guy who never went out. The man's brother would reportedly bring him hot meals two to three times a week. However, there was one weekend when the brother got sick and didn't come over. The gentleman was boiling his kettle in his kitchen, and he was so hungry that he fainted, McGregor said. The kettle set fire to his kitchen, and he was burned on his back, dragged out of his house, and he died of his burns to his back. At first, McGregor thought his neighbor was just trying to scare him, Uh, To prove his point, the neighbor called the landlady, who confirmed that story. She said, but he was a very nice man. I'm sure he wouldn't wish you any harm. That's what McGregor went on to say. Still, the Star Wars celeb was totally freaked out, so he decided to leave his room and spend the night in his neighbor's apartment. Instead, uh, when he walked in, he joked that the place was as dusty as when the old man used to live here. That's when the ceiling came down in like a wave. There was this scream like, ah! which I realized it was me, he said. During the rest of his stay in the student house, McGregor would have unexplainable experiences, like the phone mysteriously ringing or the door squeaking open on its own. I never saw him, but it was just odd, he said. And uh, there you go. That's the story. So, yeah, burns on his back. Well, I... uh... I don't know about that. It's a creepy story, definitely. But uh, as we're talking, you know, movie review time real quickly, uh, Tim and I earlier this week got to see Birds of Prey, the fantabulous emancipation of one Harley Quinn, which is kind of, I don't know if you really consider it a sequel to Suicide Squad. I mean, it is in the sense that it's still following one of the main characters, but uh, this kind of is a standalone movie. Um, I, I feel like what we just witnessed was, the birth of the DC universe's Deadpool. Yeah, that's character. exactly what it is. Yeah, and uh, but they did it well. I'll give them that. I enjoyed the movie. I laughed. I liked it. I thought it was well done. It is gratuitous violence. It is uh, lots of cursing, kids. So I uh, might be careful taking your your little ones to see it. Uh, it is all about woman power. There's no doubt about that. There are some strong female presences aboard that movie. Uh, but it is definitely filled with uh, lots of Effenheimers, lots of blood and guts, lots of violence. Uh, but it's also home to a lot of really good humor. It, 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 I think, follows the Deadpool narrative. As a matter of fact, if we don't see a teaser for the next Deadpool movie with him showing a um, two ponytails jutting out of his Deadpool <laughs> hood yeah. and carrying a baseball bat, uh, in response, I'm going to think that Marvel is losing their touch. Yeah, yeah. Because, it, I mean, it was that obvious. But it was it was really well done. But it does have me craving a Harley Quinn and Deadpool crossover. That would be good. I'd, yeah. I would pay good money to see that. They've taken, they've taken her to a, a different level. Um, so, yeah, interesting. I would say out of uh, five stars, I would give it a solid four, four and a half stars. I enjoyed it uh, for what it was and the character representations. I, I enjoyed the movie. Um, I don't think it was I, – I think it was pretty good. I, I'd go maybe four, four solid stars. That's where I would go on this. What do you feel? I think we're going to disagree on this one. I, That's I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why. I, I think Mar- – I agree with you. And Margot Robbie is is very solid, and and it's it does have good humor at times. And that Margot Robbie does carry this movie. After that, it's pretty shallow. I, I don't. I, th- I thought the characters were kind of empty. I didn't think that that the movie had much. I, the plot itself is promising. 
and it's good. I, I thought everything else was kind of flat. It was typical DC. Um, I, in that, I I thought Margot Robbie elevated the movie to something that it wouldn't have been otherwise. Um, with that, I will say that that she does make the movie and did make it somewhat enjoyable. Well, I, see, I also think credit has to be given to uh, Ewan McGregor as Black Mask. I thought his character was great, dude. I loved his every nuance of his character. Although I felt like many times we were watching Ewan McGregor acting as Sam Rockwell yeah. in the role of Black Mask, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, see, that that's... He channeled, he channeled Sam Rockwell very well in this movie to me. See, to me, um, I, I felt like he was trying too hard. That, I liked that. I liked the the kitschy over the top. I because you know what it felt like to me is it was its answer to the Joker. It was giving me kind of a Jokery vibe. Uh, Victor Zaz, I also liked that character. It wasn't much development in it, but I, I thought, yeah, yeah, that's cool. I mean, we could agree to disagree. You, you've been wrong before. People are used oh, to it by now. Wow. See, I I think <laughs> I think you're going to find that you're you're probably being too generous, and I'm probably right in line with everyone else. I'm. I'm going to go, uh, I'll even be generous with mine. At first, when I came out of it, I thought two out of five, but I'll, I'll be generous and say two and a half. See, I, I backed it down from four and a half to four. I thought that was being more realistic and because I'll, I just looked at it for what it was. I'll only I mean, here, here's the deal. I never thought she was much, uh, the, the character of Harley Quinn was never much more than TNA and dumb humor to me anyway in the comic books. Um, so it's never, you know, I think the movie stands up and actually gives her more of a, a a character I care about. So that's why I dig this stuff. But like you said, Margot Robbie definitely carries it. But oh, that's yeah, why it's yeah. called The Fantabulous Emancipation of One Harley Quinn. There's no doubt who they're hinging this movie on. And I guess she's coming back for the next Suicide Squad movie, too. Well, that's good. I mean, and, and she should. I mean, you know, Suicide Squad was kind of her coming out party. This movie firmly establishes her as a as a character that you can franchise and build more movies on. Um, I don't think by any means, I don't think that, that this movie buries her at all. No. Um, but in, and she does a, a solid job, not only solid job, she does an excellent job in, in this movie. If not for her, you would, you would, I think you would pan this movie and throw it away. Um, but I, I honestly think she carries the entire movie. It, it's she's she's the the one shining star in this movie. All right. Well, let's get back to it. I know we still have five or six stories to to power through. Mm-hmm. So where are we off to next in the world of supernatural news? A uh, church that was repeatedly vandalized by Satanists who perform animal sacrifices in supernatural ceremonies. It's uh, it's the one church you never want to go to every Sunday. We'll put it that way. Mm, and, okay. Uh. I'm trying to think of how you pronounce this church's name. St. Botoff's Church in Skidbrook is said to be one of the most haunted churches in Lincolnshire. Uh, Village Church has been repeatedly vandalized by Satanists who perform animal sacrifices and supernatural ceremonies. St. Botoff's Church in Skidbrook near Louth is said to be one of the most haunted churches in Lincolnshire. Uh, the grade one listed church has laid empty since the mid seventies, but has been listed by hordes of ghost hunters, urban explorers, and locals since its closure. Its popularity came after it was pro- uh, proclaimed to be the center of paranormal activity with people claiming to have seen ghostly figures, unexplained bright lights, and the sound of an approaching storm in calm weather. And in recent years, it has become a site of satanic rituals Uh, Residents have reported seeing chicken carcasses with their throats slit, pentagrams sketched into stonework, and rings of candles and salt inside the church. The church's conservation trust said that they have spent more than 13,000 pounds in repairs on St. Botoff's uh, church since 2015. Churches fall under the control of conservation trust when they are no longer needed for normal worship, but are too historically important to let fall into disrepair. Previous damage to the church includes its doors set on fire, bricks pulled from its walls and roof, and deliberate cracking of gravestones. Uh, The trust says there are people who still pay their respects to friends and family buried in the graveyard, and the level of vandalism is upsetting for them. 
but groups like the Retford Ghost Hunters, who recently investigated St. Botoph's Church, uh, said it is unfair to suggest that groups like theirs are to blame. A Redford Ghost Hunter spokesperson said, We always treat the area with respect, and I think it's unfair to lay the blame on us. We have been slated on social media for doing nothing but a gentle, respectful investigation, and we got some wonderful evidence. There are no signs at the site, and it is open to the public. We never go onto sites if we are aware that we aren't supposed to be there. There are so many different ghost hunting groups in the area who have been running for a while, and yet the abuse we uh, have or we've had has been horrendous. The trusts do not believe paranormal investigators are responsible for the vandalism, but say their videos have encouraged others to the site. Chief executive of the church's conservation trust, Peter Ayers, said St. Botoff's is a consecrated space, and it has been passed to the church's conservation trust to protect and maintain it. St. Botoff's church is a well-loved and important landmark in the Lincolnshire landscape. It is open to the public, and the site is also an important oasis for wildlife. We encourage the wider enjoyment and appreciation of the church. While the building has sadly been mistreated in the past, we have no intention of denying public access to the vast majority who love and respect the ancient church because of the errant behavior of a few. We greatly appreciate the support of local residents in caring for the church. and We would be delighted to hear from anyone who would be interested in volunteering with us to help care for our magnificent buildings. So there you go. That's a shame people are out desecrating these places. Yeah. We'll I wonder if it's them. truly Satan worshipers or if it's just idiot teens. I think it's probably just teens, to be honest with you. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, but it's a lot easier to hook it on the old Satanists, giving them that power again, huh? That's true. Very true. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Uh, hi, Dave. I'm a renter, not a homeowner. I live in Issaquah Highlands. I'm disabled and a government housing recipient. I can't communicate with my neighbors. They always seem angry and there's no middle ground. I've heard rumors from my family, but I've been skeptical until I watched a coffee cup move a couple of inches on its own. I checked the surface of it to see if it was wet and the bottom of the uh, can was dry. My wife says there's a supernatural vortex in my front yard all night, banging and shaking, shadows walking away from my kids. I've looked and can't find much, but maybe this place is on an ancient Indian burial ground. I have two kids of Indian blood. I don't know if that matters. This place may be of paranormal interest to someone. I love your show. Thanks, Justin White. Um, that's interesting, Justin. Here's the one thing I'll tell you. Unfortunately, most of the paranormal shows can't uh, usually can't do apartments because the apartment complexes do not want to uh, promote the fact that they may be haunted. So there's that. Um, and your best bet is to just reach out to local teams. Although we know teams all over, I, I don't know anybody in that general vicinity, but uh, I hope you get some help. You can also check a website called diedinhouse.com, diedinhouse.com. Punch in the address of the building, uh, perhaps even your apartment, and see if anybody uh, has passed away there. Maybe that would give you some more insight. All right, Tim, where are we off to next? Uh, interesting story about Derek Cora's wife, Gwen, from The Mirror, saying that she had a three-pound of pop psychic service despite not being clairvoyant. Uh, 71-year-old Gwen put her name to the late clairvoyant's phone line, selling readings for three, three pounds of pop, but she removed it after Sunday's Mirror probe, supposedly. Uh, the widow of most haunted TV star Derek Cora should have foreseen the disaster when she stepped into her his uh, shoes after he died. 71-year-old Gwen put her name on his phone line, selling clairvoyant readings for three pounds a pop, but a crystal ball would have told her it had no future. When challenged by the Sunday Mirror about her paranormal qualifications, she admitted not having a psychic bone in her body and removed her name. After Derek's death last month at 69, his website was rebranded and fans uh, were instead invited to text Gwen for psychic readings and pay to receive them straight to your phone from her team. The website says messages from all-star psychics are always answered by genuine psychics. Uh, but the mirror investigated after a tip that ex Gwen was not the real deal. Posing as bereaved relative Charlotte, uh, their reporter texted Gwen, asking to her to contact her late grandmother. Within minutes, three messages arrived back at the cost of one pound each. One said, I do sense a lady in spirit who is around you, dear. She wants to know or wants you to know that she loves you. 
Uh, the site said the texts were for entertainment, and a spokesman for Gwen admitted she does not have a psychic bone in her body. He added, uh, it's quite clear she is not doing the reading. She didn't intend to mislead anyone. She was advised to put her name to the service and the best intentions, but it will now be removed. A previous uh, ver- oh, I'm sorry. That, that it's, uh, I don't. I don't know why there, they're so. they're going after her for that. I mean, here's here's the situation. She is endorsing the site and putting her name to it because right. of her connection with her husband, a famous medium and psychic. So. Why are they begrudging her a way to make some income? She's not the one claiming to do the readings. Right. Yeah. It's it's simply an endorsement of the the line, which uh, you know, it's it's it is what it is. I mean, I don't, I can't imagine that too many people who are subscribing to the line who are actually getting readings from the line are thinking that Gwen herself is doing the reading. So, are people going to be all upset now that I'm working uh, alongside uh, Urban Outfitters because I'm not really an outdoor guy? Uh, I would, but yeah. It's, uh, yeah. Dave Schrader's urban. <laughs> I, I would think if you would be more honest, Dave, and say it's Dave Schrader's Holiday Inn lounge set. Um, yes, yeah. or suburban infitters. Right. Then I would, I would buy it because then I know it's just jammies. Yeah. Oh, that's true. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Where are we off to next? Uh, a paranormal investigator's report of a voice coming from a Fayette cemetery is unfounded, according to a state trooper. <laughs> Um, or a trooper in general, uh, a paranormal investigator's claim of hearing a female voice coming from beneath a pile of dirt in a Fayette County cemetery on Wednesday was unfounded. According to state police, trooper Jonathan M. Mosier reported that he was dispatched to rural Evergreen Cemetery on Morgantown Road in Spring Hill Township just before 10 a.m. by the unnamed paranormal investigator who called 911 claiming he heard a female's voice screaming, help, help, I'm buried alive. Well, that may be slightly creepy slightly yeah i'm just saying you know yeah might be a little unnerving uh dispatchers told Mosier the unnamed investigator said the voice came from within a pile of dirt that was inside a shed at the cemetery prior to the arrival of troopers the man reportedly purchased a shovel and began digging in the vicinity of the shed where he had supposedly heard the female screaming no female was located and troopers cleared the scene and continued patrolling fayette county this the brief incident report concluded Uh, State police said no other information was available. Uh, I don't know, Dave. Do you uh, start digging if you hear the voice, help, help? I'm buried alive. I don't know. I, I, first of all, I would be in the cemetery. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Second of all, I don't carry a shovel with me. Um, Thirdly, uh, I'd leave that to the experts, but could you imagine how unnerving that would be to, to be there and hear cries from underground? You know, I, I, yeah, I mean, first of all, it is very unnerving, but I, right. you almost have to, would everything, you know, as an investigator, you would almost have to stop for a moment and think right. is what I'm hearing an actual voice or is it a trick? Here's something else that I've been thinking about lately. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I just got done filming our first episode of season two for the Holzer Files. Mm -hmm. And I can't give anything away, but it was really, uh, it was chilling, right? And um, I had some very unusual experiences, thankfully nothing violent, but, uh, and then kind of researching aspects of the location, I wonder, you know, isn't it the Jewish faith like you're supposed to be buried within like a day of your death? I'm not so quite sure. Like you die and you get buried the next day or something. It's a, it's I think it's a quick turnaround. But I'm starting to wonder if there's a certain time that your soul is connected to the body. And if it's buried too quickly and there's, let's say, high levels of granite, quartz, um, limestone could that work as a magnet keeping part of the soul there so if if the soul has not fully disassociated with the physical form by the time it's buried could that be why the souls are at the cemetery that they're kind of trapped 
by the the surrounding minerals and elements. That's a scary thought. Right? Yeah. Right? I, I don't know. I don't know. Culture-wise, if you people know, and by you people, I mean all of you people uh, from different cultures, belief systems, religions, I'd love to know. Email me, Dave, at darknessradio.com. Uh, what is your what is your belief system? You know, how long is the soul with the body or is it immediately released upon death? I mean, they don't even know what the firm countenance of death is, Tim. Science is still saying, you know, hey, well, maybe the brain is still uh, alive for a couple hours after the, you know, the heart stops. Um, you know, there's been cases where that one doctor just kept fell, feeling pulled back. And remember, he kept feeling pulled back into the room, even though he had officially proclaimed her dead uh, like 45 minutes or an hour earlier and mm-hmm. then went back and was able to revive her with no incident. I seem to have remembered reading an article that the brain was active, what was it, four to six hours after, was it four to six hours after death had been called? Yeah, something like that. I know there's so many different articles. You know, death is like raising a baby. Mm-hmm. Right. Hear, hear me out on this because every year, well, don't, don't put babies on their tummies to sleep. Oh, don't put babies on their sides to sleep. Oh, don't put babies on their backs to sleep. Oh, don't put blankets in there. Don't do this. Don't do that. But it seems to change every few years on what we think the understanding of what's safe for babies, right? Yeah, true. Yeah. Uh, trying to get SIDS under control. But um, I, I don't know. I don't know that we really have any kind of uh, understanding. But what do you think about if uh, if we – bury our loved ones too soon is there a chance that that soul is still with the body i don't know i don't know all right that's uh, that's your brain teaser for this week kids all right where are we going next in the world of supernatural news tim going now to- that i've effectually uh screwed everybody's brain up for the day and they'll be thinking about that there you go yeah uh whispers estate in indiana is where we're going it's for sale for a hundred and thirty thousand dollars and dave you get ghosts with it so, that's not a bad deal, yeah, actually. Yeah, that's actually pretty good, especially for real estate. Oh. Uh, known as Whispers Estate, the home has a history of paranormal activity. It's listed for 130000 bucks, and you get ghosts with the deal. I say it's sold. Uh, it's a Victorian mansion dating back to the late 1890s. It's for sale. There's a catch, however. It may come with some permanent house guests. It's actually a gorgeous home. It's in really good shape for as old as it is, according to Heather Bland who is the agent selling the home on Warren Street in Mitchell, Indiana. Of course, Heather Bland is going to say that. She's the agent selling the home. (laughs) Just saying she's making a commission. Uh, Known as Whispers Estate, the home has a history of paranormal activity. The $130,000 listing price includes the furniture and the ghosts. Oh, so it's fully furnished. It's it's, it's it's just keeps getting better and better, Dave. Yeah, it does. What Uh, are you waiting for, Tim? This is your big chance. uh, It's in Indiana. There's nothing in India. (laughs) There's the Whispers Estate, Tim. Oh. Uh, The 3,700-square-foot, four-bedroom, two-and-a-half bathroom home features original wood floors throughout much of the home. Well, that's nice. Uh, According to the website created by the homeowner, the structure was once part home, part business, as was the case with many homes in the 1800s. A doctor had his practice downstairs, and over the years, some patients died, Dave, including children. Oh. Uh, the doctor himself died of pneumonia in the first floor master bedroom, uh, so you can't sleep there. Just saying. Uh, several TV shows, publications, and paranormal groups have investigated the home. There have been numerous reports of a child seen running through the house, the smell of baby powder in one of the rooms, children singing or crying, doorknobs jiggling, and doors popping open, so you don't get any privacy. <laughs> That's all right. Still a good price. 130 k This house sounds is really cheap. This house is perfect for you. There's no privacy. You're not used to privacy, Dave. It's perfect. Yeah, I don't. Who needs privacy? Yeah. Privacy's overrated. People who sleep in the room where the doctor died said they sometimes wake up to sounds of coughing and labored breathing. Oh, so it's the wheezy house. Mm. I've been in there twice and haven't felt anything so far, but you can read different things about it and you might not feel anything or see anything for a long time. And then maybe you do, Bland went on to say, adding that her boss felt and saw something paranormal when they were measuring the home. Uh, He had a look on his face and I said, what? 
And he said, did you see that? And I said, no, Bland recalls. We were measuring and I said, did you? And he said, yeah. And I was like, okay, let's get this measured then and get out of here. Oh, she's real nice, real, real empathetic. Uh, the paranormal inhabitants don't seem to cause much trouble, Bland said. The owner said in his experience, if people are there and they're respectful and not trying to cause a ruckus or anything, the alleged paranormal are nice. Oh, the current. Oh, that's nice. The current owner bought the home in 2007 after visiting it during a paranormal convention. He's selling it now because he is engaged in moving to Indianapolis about two hours north of Mitchell. As for tours of the place, we're doing a 24-hour notice before a showing and a pre-approval uh, because we want to weed out people. We don't uh, want to just have people who say, let's go look at it. It'll be cool. We want people to be serious that are looking at it. And for whatever reason they want to buy it, that's their personal preference, Bland explains. The home sits on a quarter acre. There's a formal entry, 10-foot ceilings, a living room, dining room, stone basement, unfinished space on the third floor. The furnishings include antiques. Uh, Bland says the perfect buyer is out there somewhere. It's going to take one of two types of people. I think it's going to take somebody that loves this and appreciates the paranormal stuff, or if somebody just wants it to be their home. It's a huge, gorgeous home for 130000 I mean, you couldn't build it for that, Bland went on to say. So That's true. Go. But I wonder if it's zoned. Is it zoned so that it can't be a bed and breakfast? Is it zoned that they can't run a business out of it? Because I would, you know, I would think that buying it and turning it into a paranormal investigation spot, well, you should make back your 130. At one time, it was a doctor's office. So at one time, it was zoned for business. But I don't know that it still is. Yeah, and the, the town may not want. See, I think this is what happens with Amityville. Everybody's like, well, why don't you buy Amityville? And just because I think, if I recall correctly from the people that have spoken to the realtors, when you buy the house, you have to agree that you're not going to allow filming there. You're not going to turn it into a bed and breakfast. You're not going to do anything commercial with it that mm. would that would uh, bring more attention to the area. Yeah, you'd have to check with the realtor and see if it's yeah. zoned that way or if you could zone it that way. Just something. Yeah, very weird. All right, uh, where are we going next, sir? Well, we got two stories left in this first one. Cornish Ghost Whispers film a ghost dog. You're Rover, Rover, Rover. A mother... <laughs> Aw, see? Mm -hmm. Do you use a ghost elbow to catch a ghost dog? God, no, not, not elbow. No. Elbow's horrible. It, it is, yeah. But yeah. I'm just saying, they don't yep. care they're ghosts. Can I do a commercial for something? Sure. Tim, if you don't mind, yeah. speaking of which, I've got to be honest with you. Listen, uh, I am a shill. I, I get no pay for what I'm about to tell you. But Gentle Giants Dog Food, mm -hmm. my, my dog loves this. And it comes from Gentle Giants Rescue and Adoptions, which is run by, of all people, Burt Ward from uh, Batman and Robin fame from the 1966 Batman series. He and his wife um, have helped rescue thousands of dogs, and they were looking for the right blend, and they actually created this dog food, GentleGiantsDogFood.com. Um, go check it out for yourself. My dog loves it, and he has dogs that are living abnormally long lifespans, and he's making these claims, and I'm not seeing anybody breaking him down about it. You know, people always love to poo-poo that stuff, Tim. Poo-poo, I say. Oh, poo-poo, yeah. yeah. Right. But it's world-class canine nutrition dog and puppy food. Quality of life feast for meat lovers with real beef and real bacon, 100% poultry-free, non-GMO ingredients. It's all healthy. It's all good for your dog. You can purchase at Walmart.com. You can purchase online at Gentle Giants Dog Food. I, the reason I throw this out there is because I believe that um, – you know, many of our listeners love their animals as much as I love mine. Mm -hmm. And Gentle Giants is really good, and it is so healthy for your animals. Um, and again, have six, ten years with your animal. Why wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah. How crazy is that? You have to go go to a site and you'll read it. I mean, he tells videos. He's got dogs that are like twenty five, twenty seven, twenty eight years old because they've been eating this food. Wow. Yeah. Why not keep, uh, you know, your, your uh, fur friends around just a little bit longer? GentleGiantsDogFood.com. 
that's what I would try to bribe uh, the the ghost dog out with Tim. Oh, okay. Well, let's do that then. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. This segment was not brought to you by Gentle Giants Dog Food. It was brought to you by Darkness Dave, wanting to share that information with you, our audience, because I I care. All right. Well, I'll change my my uh, tune then. We'll we'll use a little Gentle Giants and we'll, we'll bring this ghost dog out. Uh, there you go. A uh, mother and daughter paranormal investigation team from Falmouth is uh or Falmouth one or the other, is uh, attracting a big following after an encounter with a ghost dog. Candy Collins and her mother, Suzanne, have had a passion for all things paranormal for many years. But after they captured the image of what appears to be a dog at uh, Kennel Vale Nature Reserve, their popularity has soared. Candy, who lives just off of Trescobies, Trescobies Road, uh, said we did our first Facebook Live event a couple of weeks ago, and it was actually one of our followers that pointed out the dog. It's so exciting because people can come on a journey with us. It's something people can relate to and get involved in. On a Friday evening in mid-January, they visited the Ponzanuth Beauty Spot uh, around 7 p.m., and the video clearly shows a four-legged dog-like shape moving away from the camera. Since the images of the dog were aired, they have more than 4,000 followers of their Cornish Ghost Whisperers uh, Facebook page. The full version of the video, around 15 minutes at normal speed, is available on their page. Although the pair enjoys brushes with the other side, they take no chances before they head out. You have to embrace it. You have to be alert. We always say prayers before we go, and we wear protective necklaces when we go out, said Suzanne, who lives, who lives in Budok. Uh, she has experienced activity from a young age, including children's voices in her kitchen when there was nobody there, uh, something trying to get out of a wardrobe and people running up and down her stairs. Uh, during their trips, they use a trigger object sensor, which lights up when paranormal activity is detected. They also carry a ghost box and a magnetic field magnet. Uh, we're looking for lost people and trying to show them the light so they can go back home safely, she added. The ghost dog excursion is one of several trips in the area, which has yielded spooky results. Candy said, we went to Penmere Station after a man told us he was on his way home when he saw two Victorian children beckoning him to go down the track. Oh, that could be a black-eyed kid. I wouldn't go. Just saying. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when we went up there, the trigger sensor went off and our shoulders were burning hot. Uh, on another occasion, when they were at St. Cluvius Church, uh, there was a transparent gray object floating up and down something through the trigger sensor, which hit Suzanne after she had placed it down. Uh, they also visited the oldest pub in South Wales and heard children in a confined cell inviting them to come and play in the background. Again, black-eyed kids, Dave. They're just playing with the devil. <laughs> We want to play with you. No, thank you. Uh, Candy and her mom have since conducted another Facebook Live recording at Kennel Vale uh, and are planning more in the future. So there you go. So they're very just, cool. They're playing with black eyed kids and dogs. There you go. Huh. Yeah. Black eyed kids and dogs. Yeah. Uh, so you heard my dog bark, right? My. <laughs> yep. Yep. Pretty good dog bark, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm at, uh, this is my brush, my brush with fame. Oh, okay. Tim. Yeah. This this comes to us courtesy of um, roughly 25 years ago. Okay. I'm at uh, I'm at Disney with uh, Cliff, mm -hmm. my oldest boy. <clears throat> He's very little. We're sitting there at a little cafe, outdoor cafe at Disney in uh, in uh, Florida. Mm -hmm. There is a like honky tonk, uh, rinky dink piano next to us, and all of a sudden, Goofy and Mickey and Donald come walking up, and they've got somebody in between them, along with some security. The guy sits down at the piano and starts do 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 do, and he breaks into a big laugh and then turns sideways, and it's Billy Joel. I'm literally sitting like four feet away from Billy Joel, and I go, "Whoa, Billy Joel!" And because kids know two voices, mm -hmm. loud and louder, Cliff uh, eloquently yells out, Billy Joe, who's Billy Joe? <laughs> and Billy Joe <laughs> stops playing piano. It just turns and looks back at our table. And, and Cliff has got this quizzical look on his face, right? 
And I go, uh, Billy Joel, buddy. Remember that song, River of Dreams, we were singing when we pulled into the parking lot that you love so much? Yeah. I go, he's the one that sings it. Oh, that was pretty much it, right? <laughs> so then we get up. We're walking around. We go into a gift shop. Lo and behold, standing in front of me, Christy Brinkley. She has one of those uh, dog leashes, you know, the invisible dog, dog leashes. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, a leash with the little harness and it's bent. So it looks like you have a dog that's invisible, right? Mm -hmm. And she's chasing Alexa Ray, their daughter around with it going, Alexa, woof, 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 I'm going to get you. And I walk up behind her and I go, right? And I just, and my throat's kind of out of it, but I can do a pretty good dog, right? Mm -hmm. I do this. She turns around, she looks at me and her eyes get huge and she goes, my God, did you do that? That was really good. Without missing a beat, I kind of give that false mock of confidence look to her and i kind of roll my eyes i go well you know some people are supermodels some people can bark like a dog we all have our skills miss brinkley and she bursts out laughing so that was my one moment in the in the the sun with christy brinkley oh yeah just thought i'd share that with you speaking of sharing i do have another story i wanted to uh share real quickly Mm -hmm. again it's going to sound like an endorsement because it is Mm -hmm. but we don't get paid for this tim i got an email um I wanted to thank you from the bottom of my broken heart. Michael Perry was amazing. He brought back hope and light into my world. Not only did he contact my mom and many of my friends, he brought the love of my life, my little doggy Doobie. Doobie kept talking about what Michael thought was New York. Michael couldn't figure out why if I hadn't been there with Doobie. He was so insistent and kept saying it. Finally, Michael asked, have you gotten a new dog? I said, yes. He asked what kind, at which point it all came together. I have a New Yorkie puppy. We both laughed. I'm still smiling about this. Anyhow, thank you, Dave. You made it possible for me to see a light at the end of this tunnel. It's literally saved my life. Much love to you. And that comes from Mary. Um, I don't want to give any more info because I don't know how much she's looking for. But I get yeah, I get emails all the time. People are like, Dave, I really need to contact somebody. I need a very good medium. And I'm going to be honest. The first I always throw him is Michael and Marty Perry. Mm-hmm. And we know other great mediums, Mark Anthony, Chris Fleming, uh, Cindy Kaza. But you know, so many of them are out filming and on the road. They don't always have uh, the time to do the readings. Michael and Marty Perry do readings every day and, and they can do them from anywhere in the world. They can do them by Skype or just by phone. They can do them in person. And I always recommend them. And I always get emails back from people that I suggest, uh, spiritart.com, spiritart.com folks. If you are looking for, um, a really amazing reading, uh, to try to connect with the other side. I, I, I've got to say, we've known them now for 13 years. I've recommended probably hundreds of people to them. I've never had anybody come back to me and say they sucked. That wasn't worth my time or money. I've never had one, Tim. No, not one. That tells you just how good they are. So, I, you know, if you're looking for somebody, folks, uh, check it out and uh, and definitely sign up uh, with them. You know, they they're really amazing at what they're able to do. Okay. Uh, we have one more news story, Tim, where are we going for our final story? All right. You're going to wind me up. This is it. This is how we're going to end today. Doom, 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 doom. Yeah, I'm listening. Dave, huh? AI is the bane of our existence. Well, yours, maybe everybody's Dave. Everybody. Need I remind you, there are mechanical sex dolls now, Tim. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> so once they screw us, we can screw them back? Wow, again. All right. Here's the deal, Dave. I saw uh-huh. a story last night on the news. Okay. Do you know now that AI is putting Swiss watchmakers and watchmakers in general out of business? Do you know that the Apple Watch outsold even Swiss watchmakers yes, or this, this past year. The Apple Watch was the highest-selling watch last year. Interesting. The Apple Watch. The Apple Watch, you say? AI has taken over your wrist. Okay. Just saying, keep that in mind as I read this next story. I don't, I don't have an Apple Watch, so it hasn't taken over my wrist. My Google Watch sits there proudly. No Apple on me, buddy, so I'm safe. That's still AI, Dave. Doom, 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 doom. Doom, 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 doom. 
You know what that, I just realized, do you know what that rhythm sounds like, Tim? What's that? Doom, 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 doom. It sounds like heartbeat. <laughs> That's not. what it sounds like. Yeah. <laughs> only, only in your head, my friend. So the reason this has happened is because of uh, Donald Johnson. <laughs> Donald, Donald Johnson. Donald that sounds very, Johnson. Yeah. yeah. Christian that doesn't name. sound like a rock and roller or the star of Miami Vice. Would you have Would you have checked out Donald Johnson, his album? Probably not. Don no. Johnson, boom, mm. million million seller, heartbeat. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dave, Dave, AI will trick you into anything. AI will trick you into thinking you need it. AI will trick you into thinking you're hungry. AI will trick you into thinking that. You need to buy things. AI will trick you into thinking that you needed to breathe. AI will trick you into thinking that aliens exist. Well, I'll say what now? Yeah. AI will trick you into thinking that aliens exist. Uh, say what now? Artificial intelligence can fool us into believing that aliens exist. Uh, okay. Let's hear more. That's what I have in front of me right now. I have an article in front of me that says AI can trick humans into believing that aliens exist, and I don't doubt it. Okay. It says here, artificial intelligence can fool us into believing we have discovered potential aliens. This analysts have cautioned. Indeed, even PCs could be inclined to recognizing shapes as proof of extraterrestrial civilizations. This another investigation is found. That's right, folks. That's right. I'm just saying. And people could then be deluded into accepting that they are genuine. Deluded. That's the key word here. Deluded. <coughs> you, you okay, buddy? Hallucinating. <coughs> Tim needs help. <coughs> Send help. <coughs> Tim's out of his mind. These yeah, I'm sorry, buddy. These are little these aren't tickling my, my throat. These aren't my words. These aren't my words. But it's your emotion. I these can feel it bleeding are, through. These are the words of one Rebecca Benton, Dave. Rebecca Benton. Artificial intelligence is one of the achievement advances in the quest for extraterrestrial knowledge being utilized to figure out immense measures of picture with expectations of spotting techno signatures of signs of alien life. What are we scanning the universe with, Dave, in order to find these alien techno signatures? Um, Giant telescopes. That are run by what, Dave? Um, Giant telescope operators. We don't man them 24 hours a day with human life. Maybe you don't. We man them with artificial intelligence, with oh. programs, Dave. Programs are you sure? that are, you are sure? run on algorithms. Are you to... sure it's not the Canadians trying to take our jobs, Tim? No, no, they're not taking our jobs at this. Oh, they're too okay. busy getting drunk on Molson and watching hockey. Oof. You can send that hate mail right to Tim at darknessradio.com as soon as you sober up. <laughs> the fact that the fact of the matter is is we need sober algorithms of artificial intelligence scanning the universe to look for these algorithms that could be faked by AI to look for fake aliens to make us think that aliens exist when they don't. That's what Rebecca Benton is saying right here, Dave, in this article. She says she says that they are being utilized to figure out immense measure of pictures with expectations of spotting techno signatures or signs of alien life. In any case, she says, the new disclosure recommends that individuals could be, could be get amped up for potential revelations spotted by AI. She's not good at English. Uh, well, see, that's why we need AI, because, you know, you can't trust uh, humans. Look at how badly they write. But I get her message. I'm, I'm getting what she's, I'm picking up what she's putting down here, Dave. She says, just to find that they are really useless coincidental arrangements on other planets. Useless coincidental arrangements. The research made use of a specific arrangement on the diminutive person planet Cirrus, 
uh, which energized outsider trackers when it was first found. The little world, which sits in the space rock belt among Mars and Jupiter, was the subject of furious theory when stargazers spotted brilliant lights sparkling on its surface. They were in the end let down when NASA's Dawn Crucial Close or Dawn Crucial Close Enough to the smaller person planet to find that the lights were really the consequence of volcanic ice and salt emissions. In other words, AI got it wrong. They tried to trick us to think it was it was aliens. And you know what it was, Dave? Volcanic ice and salt emissions. Mm. So AI is fallible like humanity. That's okay. That should make you feel better, Tim. They might look at you and figure you're not a threat and not shoot you. They may think that you're a, a plume of salt. Or Dave, they could turn around, look at me and go, very fat alien, bang, bang, and shoot me in the head. Wow. Not just fat alien. You think AI is going to call you a very fat alien. Yeah. They, they could you think work that. on that self, uh, self-love, buddy. No, no, Dave. AI is very mean. <laughs> is it? It's very is AI mean. kind of a bully? They are fat shamers. I don't know do, if you've. do do I don't know. I don't know if you've ever run into AI before. They're fat shamers. I don't even run into much I on this planet, to be honest with you. <laughs> so this is why, folks. Artificial or otherwise. Take your Apple Watches, go to the nearest high bridge where there's a river running right through it. Just chuck that sucker off the bridge. Let it yeah. drown. Let it drown. You know why? Because I got, uh, got me for Christmas. I got one of the magnets for fishing. On the rope that can lift up to like 480 pounds. So throw your shit over the <laughs> bridge so Darkness Dave can find it. And, no, no, uh, you don't want it. Bring back new, uh, you don't bring back, uh, new antiques. No, no, you don't want it. Because it, it, it's, I'm telling you, if we don't drown this stuff soon, it's all going to, like Voltron, it's all going to come together in one big, massive robot and destroy us all. Really? Mm-hmm. What a world you must live in. I'm just saying. Your mind is so dark and sad. No. Yeah. No. For a very big fat alien, you've got a problem. I'm not a big fat alien. <laughs> Tim, That's if what AI the... said so. No, you I can't. I can't question AI. It's much more intelligent than I am. No, Lots of data. You, you saw Johnny it. Five is alive, Tim. He needs more data, more input. You can't trust him. You just can't. We'll see. We'll see. Well, that's it, folks. Uh, we appreciate you being a part of the show. We want to hear more of your phone calls. 651-300-4977. Leave up to a three-minute story. If it's longer than three minutes, just hang up, call right back, go right back into the story. Tim will stitch the recordings together into one cohesive tale of supernatural terror. You can share your scary stories, funny stories, heartwarming stories, loving stories, dream visitations, Ouija board stories, demonic angels, ghosts, aliens. Maybe you had a date with a Bigfoot on Timber. Timber. See what I did there, Tim? Because <laughs> he lives yeah. in the woods. Yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah, if you want to, give us a call 651-300-4977. Keep sending in your emails to us, Dave at darknessradio.com with your stories. And we'll be back Tuesday with another brand new edition of True Crime Tuesday. You can keep checking that out. If you haven't already checked out our True Crime shows, you should. They're damn good for the best in paranormal talk radio. I'm Dave. That's Tim. And this is darkness radio